want you to stand and worship with us.
Well, a few months ago we made a vow, didn't we? Brother Alton had just retired and then the doctors told him he, was, he had cancer. And you know, when you have cancer and the victory comes, they ring a bell down at the hospital, but we stood here and vowed a vow. When that day came, we'd blow the show for it. Still heals. Brother Alton, come you, you and Sister Eva just come on down here. Look what the Lord has done. This is a day of victory. A day of hope for those of you who maybe the doctors said there is no hope. Man, look, we always have hope in Jesus, right? He is able. He is able. He is able. Come on, shout unto the Lord. It's better not to vow, vow, not pay it. Amen. And we're going to believe you're going to walk in that healing until the Lord calls us all home on that day. I'm ready for the rapture right now. That'd be all right with me. Come on. Let's give the Lord one more good shout of praise. In this house. Hallelujah. Keep praying. The doctors to deal with that cancer, they just about had to kill you in every other way. And so he's in the rebuilding and rehabilitation stage. So don't stop praying just because the doctors gave us a good. You want to say what? For um, the prayers, standing in a gap, you. Um, you can't do anything without that. Right. Um, Brother Bobby has been on me. He stays in touch and makes sure where I'm at. We visited and everything. But, and my precious wife, she's been through it. <laughs> so uh, you, there, there are scriptures that, here, here these last couple, we have just been through it, but I know God's with us, and I know we have the victory, um, but there's a couple scriptures I just wanted to share. It's Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans and the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, plans and peace, well-being, and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Um, Psalms 139, verse 1 and 2. O oh Lord, you have searched me and have known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. Um, 139, 13 through 18. It's got so much in it. You form my innermost parts. You knit together in my mother's womb. I will give thanks and praise to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being formed in secret and intricately and skillfully formed as being embroidered with many colors in the depths of the earth, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were all written the days that were appointed me, when as yet there were not one of them taken shape. This written down, guys, in heaven, it's written from beginning to end. We're here, and we're just walking it out. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 20, I was bought with a price. I am not my own. I belong to you. Romans 8, 28, I know all things work together for those who love the Lord or to come according to his purpose. Uh, Genesis 50, 20, Joseph talking to his brothers, you planned evil against me, but God had it planned out the whole time. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Isaiah 26.3 God keeps in perfect peace those who lives are fixed on Him. Uh, Philippians 4.7 And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. And Philippians 1.6 I am sure of this that He who started a good work in me is faithful to complete it. There's two songs, two songs that really spoke to me during this whole time. And one of them is, the healing is here. And I don't know if y'all heard it before, but the, the last part of it is, sickness can't.
can't stay any longer. Your perfect love is casting out fear. You are the God of all power, and it is your will that my life is healed. And the other one is, you are the God that healeth me. That's an old song, but man, it just has ministered to me through this time. I appreciate my wife so much. She has stood at my just and I thank my church. I love you guys so much. Just, just be seated. I have purpose in that. Be seated now. Once you're, everyone is seated, if you have at some point in your life been diagnosed with cancer and God has healed you, now you stand up. Amen. I know we have some here. I want you to I want your faith to be built from this because the chances are the way this goes. That if you live long enough, then you may get that diagnosis. And the devil's going to tell you you're dead. But don't listen to him. He's a liar. And if you or someone you love gets this week a diagnosis of cancer, I want you to remember these that were standing and this one that's standing before you today, that God is able. He's able. He's able. Let's walk in faith and not fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Power, love. And of a sound mind. Father, thank you for taking care of us. We know the devil's come to kill, to steal, and destroy. We deal with him every day. But greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. Thank you for this victory. We celebrate the good the goodness of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sister Phyllis, where are you at? I, 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 come here, Sister Phyllis. Y'all go sit down. Sister Phyllis got a word of testimony. Now we're going to have a little testimony time. All right? Pull this mic just a little bit. This speaker makes it squeal like crazy when I get down here. First of all, I wanted to come and thank the church. I know they were praying for me when my son died. I could feel it in my heart. I just knew. And I could stand up here and not shed a tear until the service started. But I did greet all my family, which is a huge family. And I, I just... I know that this church has brought me through a lot, and we we have to depend on each other for that. It's it's a thing that we need, you know. Um, people don't think they need stuff like that, but you do. You need it, you know. And I I just I want to thank everybody. I know it's been since January that my son got killed. But I still, I didn't never come up here and thank everybody. I know there were people that participated in the food. They, they helped serve. They did all they could. And I told them thank you. But it's not like coming up here and saying thank you. I love y'all. Y'all did so good for me. And I just, I thank all of y'all. And my family is big. But this is my favorite family when it comes to me. Just one second. I, uh, I can't imagine anything more difficult in life than for a parent to have to bury a child. I, 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 I have never experienced it. And when, you, when someone, and I pray no one ever has to do that ever again. But when that happens, listen, casual Christianity, carnal Christianity will not take you through that. You gotta have a real sure foundation. And so I just want to say, we witnessed that in your life, Sister Phyllis. She, her faith was strong. And, and I looked at her and watched her as we walked through that, and I said, Wow, I'm not sure my faith is that strong. So find out in the storm though don't you you don't find out before you find out in when it's the testing but we do find out this that God's grace is sufficient come on give the Lord a shout of praise thank you sister thank you sister sister Lolly and I were talking yesterday um, uh, tragically that isn't that horrible I told her you can't go to Walmart anymore <laughs> well where can you go that the enemy is not trying to kill steal and destroy if you can't go to Walmart anymore and, and they told me, I read somewhere where there were 3,000 people in that Walmart and, and plus 100 workers. And I said, I had never seen a Walmart. I said, listen, I've got to that age in my life and place in my life. I don't want to be in a place where there's 3,000 people. 
I, I, I just, I, don't, I like it just a handful. And then, then I did say this, though, unless it's at the River of Life Worship Center. And then I qualified it, and I said, and uh, if all of our members showed up one Sunday, we'd probably have over 3,000 here, <laughs> and uh, especially in the summertime. So try to be faithful. We do have a number still out. There. I'm ready for school to start back, get back into a routine. and uh, turn, your, turn your mic on there. I need more than that. I want to real quick. Listen, we got a bunch of visitors at the house, and I know that we always like to welcome our guests. I know I'll start with this. Miss Jeanette's smiling big because she's got four out of six of her grandkids here. That's a testimony, too. She had surgery Monday, and she's back in church on Sunday. And then Juan, he's got half the defensive line from John Curtis over here. Good. If a fight breaks out, guys, y'all help. You know, I don't know anything about football. I just made that up. But I know they're, they got to be linemen of some type. Is that right, Juan? I see. I was right. I don't know anything about football, but I knew that. But we're so glad to have them here. And also, let's see, Sherry, Sherry, wave your hand. That's Cherry. I'm sorry. It's Cherry. Okay, that's Chase's friend. She's going to be embarrassed that I said that. And also, Erica, wave your hand. And her two beautiful children, Miss Cheryl's uh, niece, right? Okay. Let me get all this right. Okay. Stacy's got her cousin, Brenda and Bill. All right. And then also little Kaylee. Okay, I know I'm forgetting somebody because we have Mr. Mr. Danny. Where are you? Wave your hand, Mr. Gomez. Yeah, back Dad. there. Seen him so in a while. good to see him. It's been a while yeah, since maybe. he's been here. And let's see, did I get everybody? Okay, I think I did. Did I miss anybody? Is anybody I missed? If this is your first time, and I don't know you besides Debbie, we're so glad to have her. It's good to see Ken. He's been working nights. So yeah, Kenny's back in now. My band is like Mike's on nights now and Ken's on nights. So, but praise God. Y'all are doing a good job. Yeah. Kids. All right. So listen, kids are going back to school uh, this week in Ascension Parish and I think Livingston as well. And then River of Life Academy starts on Monday. So we do want to pray for the kids. Um, and we'll do, we can do that now if you want to. Call the kids up and the teachers. You want to do that? Pastor? Might as well. All right, come on, kids. Everybody is starting school this week or next Monday, and all teachers, too. They need more prayer. I saw a little cartoon, and it had a mom looking under the bed, and she it's said, not... you've got to go to school. You're the teacher. <laughs> it's not too late, too, for, yeah, for children to enroll at River of Life Academy, so if you know of someone that needs a good Christian school, we Come have vacancies. Up. Yes, we have some openings. Especially in the four-year-old classrooms. So if you know any four-year-old, going to be four by September, in the September. Be sure. Any teachers? Don't, don't, don't forget the teachers. Okay, they're hiding somewhere. They're on vacation. They won't be back. Sister Lolly, you audibleize our prayer, and I'm going to lay my hands on these children. Stretch your hands toward them as we pray now. Father, your word says if any lack wisdom, let them ask of you, God. And we ask right now for wisdom concerning our children. God, I pray for the anointing for the parents, especially, God, as we send these children out and insert uncertain world, God. But, God, you're going to give us wisdom, God. You're going to give us strength and faith and hope for good things because, God, you're the God that has good things planned for us. You have a future and a hope for us. Your word says, God. Lord, I just pray for each one of them, Lord, that the anointing would come upon them, Lord, that they would be learners and students, and that, God, they'd go out as Christians into a lost world. And most of all, God, share your love, Jesus. So, God, protect each one of them, Lord. Just put a hedge about each one of them, Lord, and in their schools and in their classrooms, God, and just give them favor. Favor them as you did Daniel and Joseph and all those patriarchs of the Old Testament, God, that had unnatural, supernatural favor in the world. God, give them favor. And God, we thank you for each one because they're all a blessing in your kingdom, God. So give us a good year this year, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget to pray for them every day as they go forward. Let's uh, stand together again. Our ushers are going to be here at the front of the church with these baskets. These three baskets are for the Lord's time. That uh, box is for the building fund. And then we have special envelopes for our mission support. 
be faithful in your giving. The attendance has been down this summer, but the giving has been down as well. So let's just reverse that and get out from under the curse and start getting back in covenant with God financially. Father, bless this time of giving, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah. Uh-huh. 
I tell you, my spirit has been lifted, and I have felt the power and the presence of the Lord, but He's going to speak to us just for a few moments. I am um, wrapping up message number nine in this ongoing series on discipleship, getting back to the basics, and I only have three points left. We're working our way through 2 Corinthians chapter 4, dealing with the subject of staying power. Not wanting to quit, not dropping out, not fainting or falling by the wayside, which seems to be in vogue today. It's a real problem in the church, contrasted to the early church. But uh, God is looking for those steadfast, immovable, always abounding Christians. And I, I tell you, we have a house full of them here. here. God has blessed me with some of the greatest Christians I've had the privilege of know, to know over these 62 years of life that I've had, 40 uh, 50 plus of them as a believer. God is good. But these are good days and the best is yet to come. Matter of fact, I'm starting to get excited. For the, this will be our third September and we're going to do it again until the Lord tells us to stop or until y'all say, ah, that's, I don't like that anymore. But right now, I like it. Still like it. Well, you know, we'll take and put the tables in here and have a fellowship and family focus month. And the first two years ago, we took that month and we focused on the family. We dealt with marriage and, and family. Then last year we dealt with the church family, the family of the church. And, and then this year, right now where I'm at, God is leading me to preach on parenting and that, that aspect of raising children. So we're going to focus, we're going to kick off the month with a children's Sunday. We're going to honor our children and uh, focus on Second Sunday, all right? Well, whenever. But here's the good thing. We're going to eat a lot and fellowship a lot. So I want you to get excited about that and start inviting people. We will have some, we'll have some type of dinner on the ground, food and fellowship right after every church service except one. And we'll do a breakfast for that one. So you come, we'll eat before the service, but for three of them, unless there's five Sundays. I haven't even looked in September. There's only four, and, and three of them, we will have big dinner on the ground, and it'll be good, or we'll have hamburger, we'll have food. So you don't have to worry about buying food in September. Just come to the river, and we're going to feed you and feed one another and have fellowship. So let's get excited about that and go out and bring them in. Now, staying powers, what we're talking about as we work our way through 2 Corinthians 4. Again, I thought last night, or really sometime yesterday afternoon, I really was going to step on the gas and try to wrap this up. Because I have a message 10 that I want to do before September gets here. And dealing with those spiritual oppositions, those spiritual things that try to oppose us being what God's called us to be as faithful disciples. And so we're going to end this series on basic discipleship dealing with spiritual warfare and taking out the giants in our life that oppose us and, and keeps us many times from the victory that God has declared is ours, victory is ours, and from the promises that God has said are ours. So I want you to start praying in that direction. We're going to wrap this up, not this week, but next week. We're just going to do one today. Give me an amen. And we're looking at the, the, the and by the way, I have already, say we started this thing out and I had seven steps. Remember that? If you have an old bulletin, we had seven steps. Well, I jumped the gun a little bit on step number one, and I preached step number four, I think it was, or four or five, 
in number one, so I, I was able to eliminate it. We're not going to come back to it. So we just have six, and we're today, we're on number four. But let's kind of work our way and kind of remember where we've, what we've come through and what we've talked about from this passage. Again, we started just verse number one. Paul tells us that we can't quit and we can't stop because we have this ministry. We have this ministry, this most important ministry, that is the message of life, the message of forgiveness. The message of mercy and grace. We can't quit because of the love of God. Remember that God loves you. As we have received mercy, we faint not. Again, that word faint means to drop out. It means to get disconnected. That's what we call today backsliders. People who drop out, get disconnected. And, and uh, the songwriter point penned it well when he said, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to lead the God I love. Anybody can testify that, that, that you've had that proning, <laughs> that, that moving away from God, prone to leave the God you love? Well, thankfully, you've come back home. But we've all messed up and taken the wrong exit. But Paul said because of the, the power of the gospel and, and the necessity of, the, of society, the need of society today, we can't drop out. We've got to keep our hand to the plow. And plow on. Then the second thing we saw in verse 2, you got to maintain a clear conscience. Sin will cause you to backslide. If you allow sin as a believer into your life, and yes, believers sin, if you allow it to be there and stay there, and you cover it up, and then you play like everything's all right, you try to hide it, sooner or later, you're going to say, why am I doing this? Because you're not getting anything out of it. The Lord's not speaking to you. He's not answering your prayers. He's not hearing your prayers because you, if, if you have a regard, the scripture says if you regard iniquity or sin in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. And so after a while, you just get bored with it and you just quit coming to church. And then that compounds the problem because you get away and out from under the preaching of the word. But it says what they said. Paul said one of the ways that we stay put and stay firm and stay focused and stay with the stuff, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We've, we've not allowed that which is sin. And that's our first instinct and when you sin is to hide it, to cover it. No, we've not done that. We've just confessed it. And forsaken it. And so if you'll do that, then you can come back from, from that backslidden condition. And then the third thing, we looked at this one primarily last week, verse number 5 and 11 for that matter, is to minister with the right motivation. you got to be what we're doing as disciples, taking up our cross, denying ourselves, and following the Lord. That's the call of discipleship. And the reason that we're willing to pay that price and he tells us right here in verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, it's not about me, but it's about Christ Jesus the Lord, his servants. And here's the motivation. I had a whole bunch more subpoints, but this was the main one, for Jesus' sake. That's why we can't quit. We serve a great God for Jesus' sake. And I will serve him because I love him. Now let's look today and uh, see if we can... Get out of here at a reasonable time this morning. But look at verse number 7 and the, the fourth of these steps. And this one is very practical. And it hits close to home for me. Paul tells us here to have staying power and to be faithful and be committed to, to stand. Having done everything else to stand. Even when things go wrong and all hell comes against you. One of the things you've got to live with, understanding, even as a Christian, there are limitations. We have to accept the fact of our limitations, our limitations. Now look at verse 7. <laughs> there is a lot of theology in this seventh verse. And the first time I looked at that, I didn't get it. But then this morning, I got it because I uncovered something and I said, uh-oh, <laughs> Ooh, that could take us a while, but I'm going to try to be brief. But let's look at some theology here. Notice verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, I, I locked in in my preparation and study for this seventh point on that earthen vessels. And that's, the, that's my point. But this morning... I, Again, I've taught this so many times, I thought it might be a good idea if I, if I learn from my own teaching and preaching. 
How does this verse start? What's the first word? It's a consonant. What is a consonant? A connector. And so to understand this treasure in earth and vessels, you've got to understand what the butt's about. you got to understand what's he talking about. Where's this coming from? And so I had to go back to get the butt, the connection, to understand what this earth and uh, this treasure is that I have in an earthen vessel. You've got to go back to verse number six. And boy, when I got to verse number six, you thought there was a lot of theology in verse number seven. When I started seeing that the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to verse number six, I said, whoa, that's good. And I don't have time because I, I just got on this this morning, so I don't have time. To, and I haven't exegeted it that deep, but there's enough right on the surface to give you a blessing today if you'll look. Look at this. Verse 6. This is the part that's connected to treasure in earth and vessels. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, because of that, we have this treasure in an earth and vessel. Now, let's break that down just a little bit. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Now, immediately, what comes to mind? When I read that, when I started thinking about verse number 6 in the theological position, what Paul is trying to teach here, where did his mind go? His mind went back to in the beginning. So let's go back there with it. Because this is what he's talking about. It's as though in verse number 6, he's just repeating and translating and paraphrasing what happened in the first three verses of creation. Let's go back. Genesis chapter uh, 1, verse number 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God. Now, let's go back real quick. I missed that. You know, if you've been around here very much, that word God. No, back up to the same, same slide. God, that, that is the, 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 the word, the name, the title, Elohim. It's very specific because it, the Elohim means God in three persons. And so on that day of darkness, when there was nothing, when God stepped out of nothing, it was the Father, the Son, who is Jesus, the Lamb of God, and the Holy Spirit. The Godhead, the Elohim, Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So in the beginning, before there was a world, before there was a universe, before there was anything, it was just darkness, just a space of darkness. Elohim. He created. And, and, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. Now let's go back to verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine. What did He do? The Godhead, the Father, the Father spoke, the Spirit moved and Jesus was the Word. When God spoke, Jesus is the word. And the spirit moved. And what happened to the darkness? Light shone out of the darkness. And so what he's saying in verse number six, God, he's speaking of creation. God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. But he did the same thing in my life. You see, sin creates darkness. Before you were saved, you walked in darkness. The scripture even says, they that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And then it even talks about satanically when we are, when we're not saved, we've been taken captive by Satan at his will and we cannot comprehend the light. We cannot. That's what it says in John chapter one, the light shined, but they couldn't comprehend it. They couldn't understand it. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Just as it was on creation day in darkness, the Holy Spirit moved and light. Hey, boy, it gets good right here. Jesus said what in John chapter 14? I am the way, the truth, and life. And Jesus is light. Light. John 1, the word light shined in darkness. Jesus is the light. Hey, watch that again. Now, Paul is referring this to what God did for us who are disciples. Those of us who are saved, are you saved this morning? How many of you remember when you walked in darkness? 
You were just like it was before creation, before the light, before the Spirit moved. You're walking in darkness. You thought like the world. You, you didn't think like God. That's why we get so frustrated with those who seem to be opposing Christ. They're walking in darkness. They can't understand. They can't comprehend right from wrong. They're in darkness. But we're not in darkness. And he, he tells us, here's what happened. The, God commanded the light, the light to shine out of darkness. That's Jesus has shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge. He give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that explains it. We've already worked through that. How come you're saved? If you're saved, the Holy Spirit. What did he do? He pointed you to the light. He shone the light. You were in darkness and the Holy Spirit brought Jesus before you and said, here's Jesus. You want to walk in light or you want to live in darkness? Look to the light. He pointed to Jesus. And so that's what he's saying here. We have this same Holy Spirit that was there on day of creation. Matter of fact, who was there on the day of resurrection when Jesus was buried in that tomb, dead for three days. The Spirit of God, that same Spirit that moved in the darkness and brought forth the light, resurrected Jesus from the dead. Amen. He's still at work. He did that in my life. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. But the Spirit of God, He came and brought me and shone the light on me. And then, because of this, because of what the Spirit of the Lord has brought light into my life, He's turned on the light. But, we have that treasure. What is the treasure? We have the knowledge of Christ. He is the, the Redeemer. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that created everything is living in me. We have this treasure. How many of you realize the Holy Spirit in you is a treasure? Amen. I mean, we treasure foolish things, don't we? And some things that we treasure are just sentimental, have no earthly value, they ain't worth a bit penny. But to you, it's worth more than money can buy. What is, what is your greatest treasure? What is it? I mean, it's easy to make our children, our wives, our husbands, our jobs, our iPhones. The silly things that we treasure that our heart is after. And that's how we, we find out where your, tre your heart is. That's where your treasure is. Where's your passion? What drives you? What gets you up in the morning? Paul is saying for the believer, for those of us who had this light shine in our heart and we've seen and known the Christ and we've known him not just in our head knowledge but in relationship, we have this treasure. In us, there's no greater treasure than Jesus. There's no greater treasure for the believer in this life than the Holy Spirit living in me. Do you get that? But there's a problem. We have this great power, all power. The power of God living in me. That's the, the good news. That's the inside. The bad news is this earthly vessel. <laughs> it's the rapper <laughs> that's given us problems. I love the way the Living Bible translates this. Uh, that earthen vessels, let, uh, the earthen vessels uh, translates in the Living Bible is held in a container, a perishable container. That is, that is in our weak bodies. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a miracle sometimes that I don't just explode. Because it's true, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And, I, and I've said that so many times, that anointing is going to kill me. Because when the spirit comes on you, you do stupid things. I write checks that I have to pay for on Monday. 
You, you see me up here, sometimes I get so full of the Holy Ghost, I get to jumping and sh dancing and shouting, and then Monday I can't get out of the bed. Because the treasures come forth. <laughs> and it's still in this earth and vessel. This weak body. That word, let's, let's keep reading that. But we have this treasure that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Why didn't God give us the same power on inside, outside as he did on the inside? He explained it right there. That the glory would go to God and not us. Because in our weakness, his strength is perfected. That word excellency means beyond all measure. What do you think of the greatest power on the planet? What is the greatest power known to man? This excellent treasure is beyond all measure. In other words, you can't even comprehend the power that is in you as a believer right now. Paul is saying, Though I'm doing the supernatural spiritual work for God, I have to confess something. I still have physical limitations. Boy, that's hard to confess, isn't it? It's hard to admit that you're getting old. It's hard to admit that you can't do what you thought you could do. It's hard to admit that in the church and in spiritual work and in the work of God that I don't have a big OS on my chest. And I'm not Superman. And because of this, and, and I'm going somewhere with this, just hold on, I'm not going very much farther, but I'm going somewhere. I'm going to tie this together. Do some theology. We're talking about staying. It's an epidemic today. Demons Christians have forsaken the work of the Lord. They come for a little while and then they drop out. Were they saved or not saved? I don't know. Jesus said if you were real, you, a real a disciple, you would have continued. So that's, that gives us some insight. Many who have left the church and who were here were baptized and saved, but left the church and went back to work. Many of them never were saved. They just had a little dose of religion. But some, there is such a thing as being backslidden. Not only Demas forsake, forsook Paul, John Mark did. Do you have in your Bible four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, John, Mark. He left Paul. Paul said, I, I'm done with him. Paul, you didn't get three strikes. You got one. You went out working with Paul in the mission field and you get tired or sick and just go back home for a hug from mama. You are done. And Barnabas had to go face to face with him. Say, Paul, you're just wrong about this. But you know what? John, Mark got back. He was backslidden. He left for whatever reason. We don't know. But he came back and God used him to write one of the Gospels. So listen, if you backslid, that's not the end. It can be the beginning of a new beginning. But we're talking about staying put and looking at ways to cause us to, 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 to again, be steadfast. I want to tell you today that, that many times people... Christians, real Christians, who got saved, who got born again, who, who were sealed with the Holy Spirit promise, have backslidden, have gone away, have backed up, who are set down, who have fainted, disconnected and dropped out. Let me tell you one of the major causes for that. Now this is practical. We have a word for it. Click on it. Burnout. Click on that slide, burnout. Now, I'm not talking about what you do with your car. Burnout. Have you ever heard of that? Burnout. Have you ever been burned out? Just, I'm just too tired. I can't do it. I, I just can't get up and go to church today. I've just got to quit teaching that class. I got, to, I, I got to take my name off that list. I got to quit pastoring a bunch of people. They drive me crazy. I'm tired. Yeah. We've all experienced a little, on some level, a little burnout. Can we just testify today that that's true? Can you go back and lift your hand in honesty and truth and say, Pastor, I've been burned out. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you're burned out right now. Now, go back to that slide you had before, that burnout with the equal signs. Burnout, here's what, let me tell you, let me tell you what burnout equals. 
If you leave burnout and burnout believer in that condition long enough, it will equal something. Next slide. Drop out. If you don't do something when you're burned out, you're going to soon be a dropout. But for this cause, we faint not. But if you're burned out, if the earthen vessel is burned out, pretty soon, you'll be a dropout. Now, what causes burnout? Now, there are many causes in the church. But I, after 43 years of ministry and 62 plus years of just living and being a part of the church, I have, I have come to, with personal analysis, my assessment from personal experience and from ministry experience. Most people burn out is caused by the failure of them to fulfill their ministry. And what happens, it causes the few that attempt to carry on the work to get tired and often just aggravated. If no one else is going to do it, I ain't either. I'm tired. It's time for somebody else to step up. So you get burned out. It's, it's a perpetual problem, isn't it? Someone gets burned out and, and drops out. And they still keep coming. But what it does, it, it, it's infectious. Because then the work still got to be done. Then the work falls on the few that are faithful. And you pile on not only their work, but your work and another person's work. And pretty soon the mule just sits down. Someone else pull this wagon for a while. Unless some other mules get up here and get hitched, I'm done. Is, is that not a reason for a major burnout? Again, it's a perpetual problem. One causes the other. It's a cause and effect. Now, I think it's a chase a rabbit. It's planned. A lot of my rabbits are not planned, but this one's planned. And I will go ahead and, and, and uh, set this up before you before I chase this rabbit. What I'm about to say applies to, of course, no one here in this sanctuary. It only applies to the TV crowd. So don't take it personal. Because I know you guys, we have none of these in the house. Now, I have a slang word, a natural word, that I think helps identify. Now, I'll give you the biblical and spiritual word for it in a moment, but I'm going to give you the one that came out of my mind. Sometimes when you get tired and nobody else wants to do anything and you're doing everything, you just want to cuss. <laughs> Dad, gummit. <laughs> hey, look, one of our presidential candidates cursed this past week in the debate, did he? Senator Biden used a word that most people don't even know what it means. The news media went crazy. He said, that's just a bunch of malarkey. <laughs> I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I was pretty much in agreement. Everything in that room was nothing but a big old pile of malarkey. Now, some of you, you don't use the M word. You've got another word. Means the same thing. And I'm not going to use that word. But in, in the country, we wouldn't have said malarkey because we couldn't have spelled that. We didn't have said dookie. <laughs> You've, that's just a pile of dookie. Well, I have regress chasing this rabbit. Right? I need to get back out of this hole that I just fell in. But here's the word. Again, this doesn't apply to anybody here. But one of the problems that's causing burnout is we have way too many, wait for it, freeloaders. Again, this doesn't apply to anybody, so don't take this personal. This is not, I'm not talking about you. Now, the Holy Ghost might be talking about you, but don't get mad at me. Freeloaders on the heavenly highway. Now, I look the word up. The dictionary does define the word freeloader. Someone who expects to get food, money, or place to stay from someone else without giving anything in return. 
How many of you remember the country uh, comedian who did the list, You Might Be a Redneck If? Yeah. Well, pastor's going to give you, you might be a freeloader. Of course, this doesn't apply to anybody here. But you might be a freeloader. Those who are watching my television, you might be a freeloader if you use the tip jar instead of the tithe basket. You haven't found or engaged in your ministry. You might be a freeloader if you haven't helped in some way to keep the buildings clean and maintained and paid for. You might be a freeloader, especially if you've not shared your faith with someone and invited others to join you for church. Again, none of y'all, this doesn't apply to anybody. We're talking about those outside the church today, of course. But again, it's a perpetual problem. A vicious cycle. People drop out because people have dropped out. We live in a day and age, and it's not just in the church, but it's infected the church. Especially in America today, in our society, in our nation today, we have a, a whole bunch of people who want everyone, wants, they want something for nothing. They want benefits, all the benefits, without personal responsibility or obligation. That's what's destroying our nation. Give me, give me, give me. They won't go to work. And it's a problem in the church. Hey, listen. Have you ever stopped to consider? Because I know people come in all the time and we'll have that time of worship through giving. But well, all they ever do is ask for me, how in the heck are we going to keep this church open unless somebody tithes? Do you think this electricity that energy just says, since y'all doing the God's work, is free? <laughs> Do you think the insurance company says, since you're doing the work of the Lord, it's free? What I've discovered, the world will charge you double. They're not giving you any breaks. This building didn't get here just because abracadabra. Somebody had to pay the bill. That's the plan is to tithe every believer. Amen. Taking responsibility. Amen. And stepping into it. $11,446 in July. Budget needs 16000 You know what that tells me? Of course, there's none of you here. I'm talking to, I'm talking to the TV camera. Freeloaders. You just slip in and you don't let, let, when it's time to give, let somebody else do it. When it's time to teach, let somebody else do it. Back to discipleship. Becoming a disciple. The process of maturing in your eternal relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you what freeloaders are. Freeloaders are children who never grow up. They never mature. They never step into adulthood. And you know what adulthood is? For a child, when you step into it, responsibility. For the longest time, you had the free ride. You didn't pay the house bill. You didn't pay the electric bill. You didn't pay the food bill. You just sat at the table and enjoyed the benefits. But sooner or later, Dad shook the nest. Get your butt out of here and get a job. But you know what? Today, we still have kids that are still living at home <clears throat> at 20. Hey, if you're in school, I guess we'll give them a pass. Man, you got kids today in America, 30, 40 years old, still living at home, freeloading. It has always been a problem in the church, but it's getting worse because of the popular self flesh driven ministry, apostasy, and the flesh driven preaching, which the Bible says ear tickling, coddling. Just sit there and enjoy. We'll, we got it. Mm -mm. Paul dealt with this in his epistles. He didn't use the, the F word. 
as I did today, freeloader. But he dealt with it in the same letter to the Corinth church, to the Corinthians. He dealt with it in every one of his epistles because it's always been a problem. But he dealt with it very specifically to these Corinth or Corinthian believers. See, freeloading is just a symptom. It's not the problem. If you're a freeloader, as if you're not a tither, if you're not a giver, if you're not a servant, if you're not plugged into the church and ministry, giving your time, your talents, and your treasures first to the Lord, then, again, I'm talking to just those who are watching that television, you're a freeloader! Of course, it's none of y'all. Y'all just, just say, thank God I'm not a freeloader. But that's just the symptom. That's not the problem. Paul goes deeper. That's why he didn't use the F word. He went deeper. He said freeloading is what we see. That's the result. What is the problem? He calls them carnal Christians. Listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians 3.1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal freeloaders, even as unto babes in Christ. Again, what is a freeloader? One who just stays home when he should be going out and got a job. He's still eating daddy's groceries. But you're, you, you're, you should be grown, but your baby's in Christ. I have fed you with milk. You're still on the bottle and not with meat. For here unto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for you are yet still carnal. Now let, 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 let's identify, because I told you a few weeks ago I was going to do this. So let, let's, let's do it right here, right now. The process of human maturity in the natural cycle. Again, there are exceptions to that. School can make differences. But if, if you're going to try to do it naturally, a human cycle, a husband and wife get married, male and female. They're fruitful and they multiply. And then you stop and think a few years, what were we thinking? <laughs> How excited we were when we held that little booger and then when the, the bills came due. When terrible twos came due. And then you're a parent with all the responsibilities. And you give them everything. I quit eating ribeye steaks and started eating turkey and bologna. Oh. Or red beans and rice with a lot of soup. That's what children do. They're going to take everything. You got to give them everything. They're expensive. And you work two jobs and you struggle and try to keep them educated and keep them clothed and keep them fed and keep them secure. And you keep them, and, but then comes the day. <laughs> and when is that normal? In, in the normal cycle after high school, right? About 18, 17, 18 years old. Listen, you ought to be packed up and gone. <laughs> Working your job at your house. With your bills. Come on, some parents ought to be giving me better amens right here. Today. So we're looking at about 18 years. Again, school can change that. Uh, sickness can change that. Uh, problems can change this. But, but in a natural cycle, at 18, you ought to have your butt out of the house. Quit living off dad, drinking milk. Get you some taters and meat. Now, in the spiritual maturity, how long does it take? What is the natural, what is the normal cycle from the time a person accepts Christ as their Savior till God expects them to be fully mature and not a freeloader? Have you ever asked that question? Guess what? I have the answer. We have it in the Corinthian letter. Paul comes to Corinth and he leads with a, as a missionary, and he leads some believers to faith in Christ. They get born again. They get saved. He establishes a church. Five years later, he writes this letter, 1 Corinthians. So what does that tell us? That God expects within five years of your conversion that you are fully discipled and mature. That's the normal cycle. 
Hebrews is one of the great passages. Hebrews chapter 5 is one of the great passages on this. Uh, maturity, spiritual maturity. Let, let, me, let me read a couple of verses. Hebrews 5, 12. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles and the oracles of God, and to become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one of you that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But strong meat belonging to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Well, there's a lot of preaching in that, but understand this. He's talking to some believers here who've been born again for 30 plus years. And they're still on the bill. And I have known some 30 plusers who've been saved, maybe, for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and you're still on the dip. <laughs> Teeth, maybe, would be a better way of saying it. <laughs> Instead of giving milk, you're still getting it. Sometimes mama got to push you away. Well, I didn't say malarkey. That was bad. <laughs> and that's biblical. I can give you that right after King James. Come on. What time is it? It's time to grow up. Amen. Freeloading is just the symptom of spiritual immaturity. What is, the, what, is the, what is God's expectation? You get saved. Of course, when you got saved, you were spiritually a baby. That's the way you're supposed to be. You need milk. You need mother's nurturing. But after five years, come on. The Bible says you ought to be mothering. You ought to be discipling. You ought to be pastoring. You ought to be teaching. You ought to be preaching. What is the solution? I'm all about solutions. Well, if you're a freeloader, a carnal believer, it's time to grow up. It's time to step it up. Get plugged into your ministry and take on your God-given role with responsibility. Let me tell you, if that happens, the few folks, and I'm not just talking about River of Life, but throughout the body of Christ who are carrying on the work, and I hate to say this because it, it shames me, but for the most part, these last few years in America, if it hadn't been for the women doing the work, men, Church wouldn't have gone under because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But we wouldn't be where we're at. We wouldn't have what we have. Many folks wouldn't be saved today. Thank God. But you know what would bring a great revival? If everybody just grow up. If you're truly born again and saved, grow up. It will encourage, it will, it will encourage, it will, it, it, those of us and those of you who have worked your fingers to the bone trying to carry on the work of God doing your ministry and everybody else's ministry so that the job gets done. Boy, I tell you what, you want to lift their spirits, you want to fire them up, you want to stir them up, come one day and say, it's my time now. Yeah. I'm ready. It happened to Paul. Here's Paul's testimony, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. How many of you know that? We have this treasure in earthen vessels, and if you keep plowing that mule, sooner or later the earthen vessel will burn out. He said we, we had a problem. We couldn't rest. Our flesh couldn't rest. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus stepped up and said, Paul, let me help. Yeah. And then he came and said, the church is being stirred up, Paul, with faithfulness. He, he, just, he says, you just wouldn't believe what's going on. People are stepping up, Paul. And what did he say? It encouraged me. It encouraged me. R.G. Lee, one of the great pastors of yesteryear, said this about revival. And I believe for revival in the church. And he said this. This is his estimation. And I say amen. If all the sleeping folk will wake up. If all the lukewarm folk will fire up. If all the dishonest folk will confess up. If all the disgruntled folk will cheer up. If all the depressed folk will cheer up. And the strange folk will make up. And all the gossipers will shut up. And true soldiers will stand up. And dry bones will shake up. If all the church members will pray up. Then we'll have revival. But there's a lot of ifs in there. Ifs, ands, and buts. 
How do we stop the burnout in the church? It cause folks to stop dropping out? Let's not overwork them. Let's everyone, a member of the body, step in and grow up. It'll encourage, let me tell you what, I don't know how it's going to encourage the rest of the, the it'll encourage this one. You want to encourage an old pastor that's been doing this for 22 years? You come to me after church and say, Pastor, it's my time. Yeah. It's my time. God spoke to me. I'm stepping up. Hallelujah. I'm stepping up and I'm stepping in. You can count on me. You can count on my commitment. So there it is. But here's the second thing that's got to happen if we're going to stop the burning. The, the freeloaders have got to step up, but the heavy loaders got to be careful. I'm going to speak to the heavy loaders. I started to say front loaders, but sometimes you got to load from front, back, side, and rear. Let me, let me speak to those faithful servants who've been here, and some of you have been here predate. I, I called 22 years. Some of you got called longer than that. You've been faithful. God has called you here, and you have a passion and a, and a heartbeat for this area, for this lighthouse, for this church, and you're, you're called, whether I'm here or not, you're called here. You've gone through two or three pastors, and you've gone through a lot of things. You've gone through fire. You've gone through flood, but God has called you, and you're tree planted. Yeah. I'll speak to you just for a moment. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Because we're ministering in these days of apostasy when there's the churches, there's more freeload. And not again, I'm not speaking to anybody here, I'm speaking to the television. But in the average church, there's more freeloaders than there are heavy loaders. There's more baby milkers than there are meters. And what happens, those of you who eat the meat and serve the milk, if you're not careful, you're going to burn out. I've seen it in these 22 years. People really get fired up. You know, I, I've watched a few people. Brother Dwayne, hopefully I don't embarrass him. This brother and his wife, they just come in and just put their hand in the plow. We just, Kevin, I, I could just call other people. New, new people that God has brought in here that, that I, but my concern, because I've seen it repeated over and over and over. We will work them and they'll work and work and then pretty soon they'll say, I'm tired. Pace it. Listen, I, I gave up a long time ago trying to keep up with Miss Lolly. Let me, let me promise you this. There's a few other people in here, but you try to keep up with Miss Lolly and all that she does, you're going to get burned out in about two weeks. It used to bother me, but it don't bother me anymore. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh. Take it easy. Didn't the eagles say that? Take it easy. God has called you to do your job. Exactly. Now, there, there are some times that you can fill in, but you can't live in the fill in, or your job's going to suffer. Sometimes we're, we've done other people, here, watch this as well. Sometimes we've done other people's ministry so long until it becomes hard to give it up. And we're, you're in the way of someone else stepping into their ministry. And you know what I would believe would happen if sometimes if we would stop doing the work that we're doing for somebody else, maybe that other person would say, well, they need me. But as long as a few will do the job, then the rest will let you. No, sometimes we just need to let the paper stay in the floor. You know, I can't do everybody's job. That's a problem. Here's another problem. Sometimes pastors drive their churches to burnout, and I'm not going to do that. I don't want you here every day and every night of the week. Here's a good verse on burnout. This is a burnout buster. Exodus 23, 29 through 30. I will not drive them out. God is bringing them into the promised land. He's bringing them in. But there's going to be enemies there. They're going to have to fight battles. They're going to have to deal with the devil. They're going to have to clear a path. They're going to have to walk in the wilderness. He said, I will not drive them out before you in a single year. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. Did you get that? Sometimes I wish it slam, bam, pow, it was all done. Sometimes we got to just say, no, no, this might take a few days. This might take a few years. Sometimes we've just got to be patient and not try to get everything done in a moment. Back to our text, and I'm closing. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels. 
that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And then he testifies. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Why? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And the life, life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. We have this treasure. What's the greatest burnout buster? This treasure. You got to understand, it's in an earthen vessel. You got to, you, you, you. But here's the crux, crux of the matter. The vessel may be frail, but the treasure is not. The vessel may be subject to the pressures of this life, but the treasure is not. The vessel may be beaten down and driven to its knees, but the treasure rises above the occasion. Yeah. This is what I want you to get today. The precious gift of God, the treasure of His Holy Spirit. We're going we're gonna to really four and five connect together. I just didn't have time to connect them today. But next week we're really going to get to how, how to keep from getting burned out. But, but the Spirit of God has placed in us, and, and He is more, the Holy Spirit in me, and the Holy Spirit in you is more than able to sustain you through everything that this life might bring against you. What is your worst fear? The Holy Spirit is able to get you through that. Raise your hand, sissy, wave it around. Sister Phyllis, wave your hand around. I talked about this. There's no greater fear grips my heart than lose one of my children or my grandchildren. And I can't even imagine that. But God's grace will be sufficient if it happens. Yeah. Why? I have this treasure! Yes, Lord. It's in an earthen vessel that weeps and cries and grieves and wants to quit. I have this treasure. The power is not in the vessel. We need to get off our high horse and think we can do all things without Christ. We can't do anything without Him. I can do nothing but fail. The power is not the vessel. It's the treasure. And as long as we guard the treasure, God will preserve the vessel. Amen. The treasure is what pre preserves us. The presence of God in our life is sustaining, giving strength to endure the hardships and the pressures and the challenges of ministry. It is the power. Now here's a verse. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Worship team, if y'all would come get in place. This is a verse that the Lord gave me this morning. A lot of this just really came together this morning. Paul writing to a young man that's just getting started in ministry, his disciple, Timothy. A young man who's going to be a pastor, he's going to have to deal with the challenges of his flesh and his weak vessels, the frustrations. He says, listen, Timothy, you got to remember this. you got to remember this. you got to remember this. As you launch into ministry, I remind you, stir it up. Stir up the gift of God, which is where? In you. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. So Paul is saying, Timothy, you have a treasure. You have a gift in you, the Holy Spirit. And so every day you got to stir Stir it up. Stir it up. And sometimes you stir it up through the laying on of my hands. Sometimes I need to get, you just, when you start feeling tired and weak, you need to get to the altar. And you need to let Pastor Paul lay his hands on you, Timothy, and stir you up. That's why we can't forsake church. That's why when we don't feel like going to church, when we're tired and we feel burned out and the job is taken here, you've got to drag your behind on into church today because it's in here that you can get stirred up. We're going to stir you up today. As the worship begins, it, it stirs up that Spirit of God that's within you. You start feeling the Spirit of the Lord coming alive in you. Paul says, don't, Father, don't ever forget. Keep remembering this. Stir up the gift that is within you. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power. That's the gift. And love and a sound mind. Stir it up. Stir it up. Some of you, you burned down, you burned out. Some of you, you're still carnal. You know what you need? If you're saved, you need the Spirit 
that treasure in you stirred up today. And maybe you need to come and get at this altar and say, I want that, I want a stirring in my spirit. I want the spirit of God stirred up in my voice. Listen, when you get that fire stirred, well, that's what happens with a fire. You ever build a fire and you just leave it like it is, it'll just go down. But if you go over there and poke it and stir it up, man, I think a blaze right on back up. Listen, the fire's gone a lot below. We're going out. Stir it up. If you're saved, you have the Spirit in you. Crying, I'm a Father. Slip to your feet. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Turn the camera off, please. The altar's here. Counselors are here. To lay on hands. There's something about the laying on of hands that will stir some things up in you. what the Lord tells you to do right now. Father, stir it up. Stir up the 